This morning, we are bringing to a conclusion this series that we have been in now for most of the spring called Joy Ride. We've been working through the book of Philippians, and uh, we're, we're to the end of the book now. Uh, this morning, the last message in this series is going to be a message I'm subtitling Lessons in Contentment. Lessons in Contentment. Before we really get into that, though, a um, couple of things just to kind of look ahead. Next weekend, you are going to want to be here next weekend. It's Mother's Day weekend, and we have a very special guest speaker that we have brought in all the way from my house Hey, can we have, a, we have a picture here. Crystal Conrad is going to be speaking. Now, here's the thing. Here's what you have to understand. I have asked her to speak a number of times in the past, and she has repeatedly turned me down. And so when we were at staff meeting a few weeks ago, I said, does anybody want to speak on Mother's Day? And I thought Pastor Becky was going to probably jump at it because she loves opportunities to speak. And Crystal was like, me, it's me. And so the fact that she is like ready and raring to go, she is, is going to come uh, fired up next weekend. And you are going to want to be here for this. It is going to challenge you. Um, yeah, you're going to want to be here for Crystal. She's going to do a great job next weekend. And then following that, we're going to begin a new series that we're calling Seeds. And for the next few weeks after that, we're going to just be talking about what does God have to say about sowing and reaping? in different areas of our life, sowing and reaping, and just this principle that is interwoven in so many different ways throughout God's Word. And so what does it look like when we plant seeds and, and allow those things to, to reap a harvest in our life? So that's kind of where we're going in the near future. But this morning, lessons in contentment as we finish up Joyride. There was a father of a, of a very wealthy household, very wealthy man, and, uh, and he had a son, and he decided one day that his son probably just didn't have quite a healthy uh, understanding of exactly just how good they had it. And so he thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring my son, I'm going to take him out to the country, and we're going to go visit a farm, a farming family that is you know, considerably poorer than we are, and hopefully he's going to get to just, through observing the way of life that they have versus the way of life we have, he's going to gain a healthy appreciation for all of the great blessings that we have. And so that's exactly what the father did. He made the arrangements. He took his boy. They went out to the farm. They spent the day out there. And now they're on the return trip home back into the city. And uh, the, the father says, well, what did you think of our day at the, at the farm, son? The boy says, boy, dad, did you, did you notice how these poor people live? The dad says, yeah, I sure, I sure did, son. Tell me, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? And the son says, well, Dad, here's what I noticed. Here's, here's what I really noticed when we were out there. I saw, Dad, that, that we, at our house, we have one dog, but I noticed there was like four farm dogs running around this place. And Dad, you know what else I noticed? I noticed that we have a, that we have a, a nice pool in our backyard. It's, you know, it's a nice pool, but I noticed they had a creek that runs endlessly through the entire property. Yet, Dad, you know what I noticed? I noticed that, that our property, is, I mean, we live on a pretty small city lot. They've got miles and miles of farm fields. I noticed that our view is blocked by all kinds of buildings in the city. And I noticed as they stood on their front porch, they could see an endless horizon. Dad, you know, I, I noticed that we've got to buy all our food. And it looks like they grow all their food. And so, Dad... I got to tell you, I'm just, I'm just so thankful that you brought me out here so that, I, so that you could show me just how poor we really are. <laughs> what an interesting perspective. What an interesting perspective. It's remarkable how some people, like this boy, can find the positive spin on just about anything. Right? That they can see any situation and they can and they could find themselves being content or happy with just about any situation. But I think we probably all know some people, and maybe in some cases we are the people that doesn't matter how good we have it, it doesn't matter how much we have, there's a sense of discontent. It's never enough. There's never a sense of fulfillment. There's never a sense of, of happiness. It's like the one preacher I heard, he said, uh, he said, I really am, I really, really am very content with everything in my life until I start looking around and see all the things I don't have. 
And then that content goes away very quickly. And discontent wants to move in. And so we're going to spend some time talking about discontent. I would suggest to you that discontent lies at the heart of so many of our struggles in this Christian life. When you and your spouse first got together, I mean, they were the one for you. Wow, they were such a good-looking, beautiful, handsome, attractive individual. I mean, wow, there was nobody else on the planet for you. But now the years have passed. Maybe there's been a few extra pounds that have been added to their frame. Maybe a few extra wrinkles that have been added to their complexion. And suddenly, the person we were so content with once upon a time, now there's a sense of discontent and they're not nearly the same person in our eye that they once were. And our eye begins to lustfully wander out of discontentment. We were completely content, completely happy with our kitchen. Wow, we've got a great kitchen. It's awesome. Until you walked into your friend's house and saw their kitchen. <sighs> no fair. They have a sink right in their island. I don't have a sink in my island. This isn't fair. And the next thing you know, what are you doing? You're online scrolling through houses to find one so that you can have a kitchen like your friends do. You were content until you saw what you didn't have. You know, <laughs> I don't even like country music. Anybody with me? I don't like country music, okay? But you know, like three people. Okay, good. I, I know my audience here. I don't like country music, okay? But here's the deal. I saw all my friends this weekend on Facebook going to Garth Brooks. I don't like country music. But I suddenly found myself, I want to have friends in low places too. You know, like, come on, I want to be there, right? Why? Because somebody else has the thing that I don't have. Discontent. It actually is something that naturally occurs in all of us. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 7. He, he's addressing a crowd. He says, on the, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his, what's that say? From his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. From his innermost being. The, the Greek word that represents that phrase, innermost being, it's the Greek word koilia. Koilia. And here's what it means. It means insatiable appetite. It's an insatiable appetite. It's, it's representative of your stomach. Okay? So, so think about this. You go to the Chinese buffet, and I mean, you just load up three, four plates of food, whatever. I mean, you just pig out, man. And you get to the end of that experience, and you're like, I could not eat another bite, right? Been there, right? But where do you find yourself like three hours later? You're at home, opening up the fridge, we got anything to eat around here, right? Because you have physically an insatiable appetite. It doesn't matter how much food you stuff into yourself, you're going to get hungry again. Tonight you could go home and you could sleep for a solid 12 hours. You'll wake up completely refreshed. Oh, it'll be wonderful, but what's going to happen by the end of the day tomorrow? Oh, I can't wait to get to bed. I'm so, why? Because your body has an insatiable appetite for sleep, right? An insatiable appetite for food, an insatiable appetite for drink. And those things don't just apply to the natural realm like food and drink and, and sleep. It applies to your spirit. And so this word that Jesus uses, your innermost being, is talking about a void within your being that it does not matter what you try and plug into this thing. You can try and feed this with anything and everything that you want. It's never going to be satisfied. It's never going to be satisfied. It's always going to want more. It might satisfy for a minute or an hour or a day or a week, but eventually it's going to want more. Jesus says, but I do have a solution. There's rivers of living water. If you're genuinely thirsty, if you'll come to me, I'll begin to fill that with something that does not dry up. 
I'll begin to fill that insatiable appetite with something that will never run out if you'll come to me and allow me to be the source of filling that in your life. This is a relevant message to every one of us because each and every one of us is born with a natural propensity to be discontent. And only God, only God can fill that in our lives. The Apostle Paul, writing this letter to the Philippians, beginning to, to, to wind down the letter in chapter 4, and he writes these words to them. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be, what's the word? Content. I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then one of the most well-known verses in all of Scripture, verse 13, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. We've talked at length throughout this series about the circumstances that Paul was living under when he wrote this letter. I don't want to elaborate too long on that today because we've talked about it quite a bit in the previous nine weeks. But uh, for those that are are new or uninitiated in this, Paul's writing this from a Roman jail cell. Um, He's been there for about two years. He's actually just spent about two more years previous to this in a jail cell in Caesarea. So he's on a a four-year prison stint. Okay? As he's in this jail cell, really the Bible describes it in Acts 28, more like a rented house. He's in this, this, this you know, house confinement, and he doesn't have, I mean, it's not like they're feeding him the hot, highest quality food. His, his rations are meager. They're probably not that good to begin with, and there's not very much of them. His blankets are probably full of holes and, and uh, not all that quality. The bedding isn't particularly good. The bed itself isn't particularly comfortable. Um, it's, it's not an ideal situation. He's chained to a Roman guard, right, day and night. He's just in the same little room day and night for years, right? And so it's not an ideal situation. And he doesn't have any money, really, other than what the Philippians have sent him. In fact, they've just arrived recently. This guy named Epaphroditus, we see him in chapter 2, shows up with a little gift of money. And, and um, you know, and so, and so that's kind of, if that doesn't happen, Paul doesn't have much. He can't afford to buy more blankets or more food or that kind of stuff. And so his, his situation really isn't all that great. There's, things could be a lot better. He's had to do without a lot of things, right? And yet, in the context of that, what does he, he say? He says, listen, even though I have, there's this lack in my life, I want you to know that you can experience contentment, that you can be content. And he says, I've learned, right? And he uses that word, learn. This is why we're calling this, this message uh, lessons in contentment because it's, it's a learning process, right? I've learned what it means to be content, He says it twice. He says it first, I've learned what it means to be content. Then he says, I've learned, uh, the second time, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. And he testifies that that this contentment is something he's learned. Regardless of circumstances, he's learned it in seasons of lack, and he's learned it in seasons of plenty in his life. And so this morning, here's what I want to do. I'm actually going to introduce you this morning, or I should say reintroduce you to an old friend. You didn't know this was your friend, but you're going to discover really quickly that you actually have had a long-standing acquaintance with this friend. Are you ready to meet your friend? Okay, we can put it on the screen. It. This is your friend, It. Not the creepy clown horror movie, It. We don't roll like that around here, okay? Uh, It. What is It? It is the thing that is out there that you have determined in your mind or in your heart, if I could grab a hold of it, I know I would be happy. If I could just attain it, if I could just have this experience, if I could only just get to this place in life, then I know without a a doubt I'll be fulfilled. I know that I'll be happy. I know that I'll have lasting, uh, lasting contentment in my life. It is simply what I think I need to be whole or happy. And every single one of us goes through phases 
with it. We've had a long-standing relationship with it. We've got some teenagers in the room. Where are my teenagers at? Give me a little, like, Come on, there's more than one. Come on, if you're a teenager, give me a Oh, you guys are so wimpy. Okay, come on. Yeah, so there's some teenagers here. They're just being shy. Okay, so here's the thing. When you're a teenager, you start to think to yourself, if I could just get my driver's license. Oh, I will have arrived when I get my driver's license because now I'm no longer confined to mom and dad having to bring me everywhere. I'm going to have all this freedom, right? And so as your teenager, one of the versions of it is the driver's license. Like, oh, if I could just reach that, my life is going to be perfect. Okay? But then you discover really quickly, maybe that wasn't the case. Then you move into college, and you get to the place when you're in college and, and you're working through all those classes and all those tests. And right now, a lot of our college students, they're in like finals mode right now. And they're crunching down hard. And they're just thinking, if I can just get through this season, if I could just graduate college and get into the career force, that will be it. Then I will have arrived. Then I'm, I mean, life is beginning for me when I get out there into the career world. If I can just get through this. They get out into the career world. And there across their office is the most lovely or attractive individual they have ever set eyes on. And a romance buds. Young love. Oh, it's wonderful. They fall in love. They're the perfect match made in heaven. And they start thinking, if we can just get married. Oh, when we get married... That's it. Life will have begun when we get married. I mean, I'm just, I cannot wait until oh, it's going to be perfect. And so they get married and they move into an apartment because that's what young married couples do. They move into an apartment and they're living in that apartment. And for a few days, they're thinking, this is awesome. And then they realize that their neighbors upstairs are noisy and their neighbors downstairs are noisy and their neighbors this way are noisy and that way are noisy and across the hall are noisy. And pretty soon they find themselves thinking, if we could just get out of this apartment and get into a house of our own, life will begin. This will be perfect. And so they, they work hard, they save up the money, they buy a house, they move into that house, it's wonderful. And after a few weeks of living there, she, the gal, looks around and says, you know, I mean, we bought a three-bedroom house and we only occupy one of those bedrooms. I mean, we need to find something to fill this house with and we can either get stuff or we can get kids. Honey, we're going with the kids. Either get some blue paint or some pig paint because I need a nursery and I need one now. And if I can just have kids, it I'll have reached it. I'll have made it. I'll be content. We'll be happy. And then the kids come. And the kids, maybe in some cases, keep coming. <laughs> I, know some, I know some people like that. <clears throat> and after a little while, you start saying, not, oh, if the kids get here, that will be it. it the tune changes really quickly. If we could just get these kids out of here. <laughs> right? If we could just get these kids, huh, baby, it will be you and me again. If we could just get these kids out of here, I mean, if we can just make it through the next, let's see, how old is he? He's three. Can we get rid of him when he's 17? Is that legal? <laughs> 14, we'll carry the one. Like, we're, we're doing the math. We're just counting down to get these kids out of here so that we can be uh, uh, alone again. And then, oh, that, and then finally that day comes, and now it's like, okay, if I can just retire. I mean, back in college, it was if I could just start the career, that'll be it. Now, if I could just be done working and get to my retirement. And I mean, we just chase our tail on this, don't we? Just one thing after the next, after the next, after the next, after the next. And what you'll find is if you have the mentality that says, just around this corner is true happiness, guess what you're actually going to find when you come around the corner? Another corner. You just keep finding another corner as you chase after it. Now that I've described, how many have a, a little bit of a relationship at some time with it in your life? Yeah, of course you do, right? You've chased after it. You've got a version of it in your life. I do as well. And the truth of the matter is, if this is what we're pursuing with our, with our life, if this is the pursuit of our life, we're never going to find true happiness. We're never going to find contentment from reaching and grabbing hold of it because there's always going to be another it. 
Maybe nobody in the Bible learned this lesson in a harder fashion than a guy by the name of Solomon. King Solomon was the son of King David. David, of course, known really as the greatest king of, of Israel. Solomon it was to be his successor as king. And sure enough, David hands Solomon the keys to the kingdom. And when he does, he hands him the keys to a thriving kingdom. Things are going really well for Israel at this point in time. Militarily, they're in a great place. Like financially, they're in a great place. Like it's just a really prosperous time for Israel. King David has done all the heavy lifting and all the hard work. And Solomon has sort of inherited a kingdom where he's able to just kind of coast on the work that his daddy has done. Okay, and just kind of sort of live in the prosperity of that. And to add to that, Solomon when he starts out, he's got the attitude that his dad had. David, we know, is the man after God's own heart. Solomon starts off, and that's who he wants to be. He wants to honor the Lord with his, with his life. In fact, we, we catch a pretty good glimpse of this in 1 Kings chapter 3. It says there that at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. This is early in his kingship. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, and it's kind of a lengthy answer, but the heart of the matter is in verse 9. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the destruction of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. Goes on to say, I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. Solomon gets to live essentially every man's fantasy. Okay? He, God says, here's the deal. You are going to have immeasurable wisdom. Like you are going to be the most wise, intelligent person on the planet. And people are going to, they're going to flock to you from all around the world. They're going to come to you to just sit at your feet and learn from your wisdom. I mean, I don't know a man in my life who would not enjoy that position alone. Like we as men, we love when people want our advice. We love it when people want to hear what we have to say about the matter. Oh, you're fixing that? Well, let me tell you, here's what you, we love it when they listen to us. Okay. And so Solomon has got immeasurable wisdom. He goes on to say, not only he's got immeasurable wealth. You're going to be richer than any king that has ever existed or that's alive, at least at the time. You're going to be so wealthy. Not only that, you're going to have immeasurable honor. I mean, they're going to respect you and honor you. They're going to hold your name in like the highest regard. I mean, that is any man's language to just be respected. Oh my goodness, this is so good for him. And then, it's like we know from other portions of Scripture, he was, like, he was withheld from, from nothing, and so he had availability to all the choices, food, and just all this incredible stuff. He had a measure, well, I guess it's measurable, but uh, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, okay? That's close to like immeasurable wives, okay? Like this guy had, yeah, I don't know what you do with that many wives, but Solomon found something to do, okay? That sounds like a messy situation to me. But... This guy was living the dream. He was living every man's dream. And yet, he's known as a king of complete and total discontent. You read the book of Ecclesiastes, which he wrote, and throughout the book, I mean over and over and over and over again, you know what, you know what phrase shows up? Everything is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. No matter what I try and stuff into my heart, no matter what I try and find fulfillment with, it's meaningless. It doesn't fulfill me. It doesn't bring me contentment. One such verse, Ecclesiastes 5, just kind of a snapshot of some of the other stuff from the book. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Solomon find, finds out the hard way that all of the stuff he's given 
it ends tragically for him. If you know his story, he breaks away from God. He doesn't, doesn't serve God wholeheartedly. He's not remembered as a, as a healthy, good king, but he's, he, he really lives most of his kingship out separated from God. Okay? He misses the mark even though he was given such a great start. He had to learn this the hard way. Solomon came to learn it. Paul understood it. Paul, when he was writing a, a, a different letter to his companion, Timothy, 1 Timothy, he writes this to him. He says, Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, important to note here, the Bible never says that money is evil. It never says that having money is evil. It's not evil to be rich or to have a lot. The Bible never says that. But what does it say? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. He says, Timothy, let me warn you that if you want to pursue riches, if that's your chief aim and goal in life, if you think pursuing all of this worldly wealth, you think that's going to bring contentment, you're sorely mistaken. Timothy, it's a trap. It's a temptation. It's a snare. You've got to be so careful here, Timothy, because it'll lead you astray. It'll bring destruction to your life. And he goes on here at the end. He says that Christians, they've wandered from the faith and they've pierced themselves with many griefs because they've made the pursuit of riches, worldly riches, to be their chief aim. And so, Timothy, if you insist on pursuit of those discontented longings of your heart, you can expect to have your heart get hurt. That's the message Paul gives to Timothy. Solomon understood it. Paul understood it. Jesus understood it. Jesus said these words in Luke 12. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Jesus says, watch out. Beware. This acquisition of all these possessions, that's not what life is all about. You've got to be so, so, so very careful. The notion that anybody might have, that the acquisition of it, grabbing a hold of it, if I think for one second that that is going to somehow bring lasting contentment to my life, I'm gravely mistaken. It's never been true. It never will be true. Grabbing a hold of it, whatever that is, is not going to bring you contentment. There's great danger in thinking that way, and there's great danger in discontentment. But, Paul says, There's great power in learning contentment. See, when I'm content, the good news is when I'm content, I can thrive here and now. Discontentment relies on words like once and just and if and when and someday. Right? Discontentment relies on words like that. If I can just get that, once I achieve that, when I get there, someday I'll get there, if I achieve this, then I'll be happy, right? There's an if-then principle with discontentment, but discontentment can never deliver on that. Contentment, when we learn contentment, it allows us to say, regardless of what's going on in my life right now, I can walk in peace and joy here and now. Right here, right now. I can just walk in this right here, right now. Even though all of my circumstances around me might not be that great, maybe they're not that desirable, but I can still walk in peace and joy. Contentment delivers on what discontentment only falsely promises. Contentment delivers on it. That you can have peace and joy here and now, even though things aren't ideal. And Paul says, as we talked about before, it's a learned behavior. It doesn't come naturally. It's got to be learned. And so some of us, we need to enroll in the school of contentment. We need to learn some of these lessons. And actually, I would, I would be willing to wager many of us, maybe all of us, have had to learn this already, and you didn't necessarily even realize it. Here's what I want you to do. Think back, and some of you are going to have to think way back, and some of you are going to have to think back to, like, the parking lot, okay? Think back to a time in your life when you were broke, okay? Think back to a time in your life where you, whatever you want to define broke as, you were broke, okay? 
And for many of us, maybe a classic representation of that would be like, we're just graduating high school, or we're just graduating college, maybe we've been living under mom and dad's roof, and now we're going out on our own for the first time. We're getting that first apartment, okay? And all of your life, you've lived under mom and dad's roof, and as a part of that, you had access to mom and dad's stuff, right? But then you moved into an apartment, and surprise, it wasn't fully furnished, right? And so you had to learn some things, and you had to learn some things really quick. And what you learned in that setting was that a cheap card table can actually work as a kitchen table for a while. That you didn't need to have a finely handcrafted oak table like your parents did, okay? That you could get by with a, a cheap card table and some folding chairs for a season, what you, what you discovered, what you learned in that process was that it was a whole lot more economical to drink Folgers than it was to go through Caribou drive through every day, right? That when you were living under mom and dad's roof and you didn't have to worry about it, sure, Caribou drive through sounds, sounds great, but at five or six dollars a cup of coffee, you're like, man, I could, I could get a whole can of Folgers for something like that. And that'll last me a long time. And so you learned how to do that. You learned in that process that you can actually see the image on a 30-inch screen, not just on a 72-inch screen, right? See, what you discovered is that all of the stuff that mom and dad had in that setting, you, you begin to realize they didn't just get it at the snap of a fingers. They didn't just get it overnight. It didn't just magically appear out of thin air, that they worked their lifetime to acquire all of that stuff right? And now you're finding out that, wow, there's going to be a little bit more to it than just snapping my fingers and making it appear. I'm going to have to work for some of this stuff. And so you learned how to live without. And I would be willing to bet what you also discovered is that the quality of your life didn't suffer one bit sitting at a card table for a kitchen table versus a nice table. The quality of your life didn't suffer one bit watching whatever you were watching on that smaller screen instead of the giant screen. The quality of your life didn't suffer too much by drinking Folgers coffee. Maybe a little downgrade there. <laughs> you got by. You learned to be content without. Now, fast forward 10, 20, 30 years, you know, wherever you're at in life. You've got a better job now. You're more established. You're probably not living in that apartment anymore. Maybe you are, but maybe you're not. You probably don't have that card table for a kitchen table anymore. You've upgraded since then. Maybe you've gotten a bigger TV. Maybe you're drinking a little bit uh, more caribou these days, okay? Like you've, you've moved into a different place in life, and you're not in that place of lack anymore where you learn contentment, but now you're in a place of plenty or prosperity. And I would say that, that for many people, it's... Uh, it's, it's somewhat natural to learn contentment in those, in those seasons of shortage. It's a lot harder for some of us to learn contentment in those seasons of sufficiency. Because now we've got all that stuff, but if you've noticed, your eye still goes towards the stuff you don't have. And now how can I get a boat? Now how can I get a new four-wheeler? Now how can I get you know, whatever it is, right? And our eye begins to drift to these other things. Have we learned contentment both in the seasons of shortage and in the seasons of sufficiency? Some of us need to re-enroll in the school of contentment. We graduated from one version of it, but we need to re-enroll and learn some of these things again. Say, Pastor, this is kind of a hard message this morning. It is. It is a hard message. It is hard, especially, I think, for our American ears to hear a message that says that we might actually have to do without some things. Pastor, do you mean to say that following Jesus means that I might have to leave some things behind? Yes. Following Jesus means you might have to leave some things behind. And, and I want to be really clear about something. Not for one second am I suggesting that you can't have nice stuff or that, you, that when we follow Christ it means that, that we can't have you know, financial means available. Listen, no, but those things cannot be our source of contentment. If we're, if we're holding those things up as the way that we're finding fulfillment and contentment and happiness in life, we've missed the mark. And those things may be the very things that, that, that Christ would ask us to leave behind as we continue on the journey. It is hard. It's a hard message. Good news is, it's not just hard for our American ears. This was hard for Paul too, okay? 
Paul isn't writing anything that wasn't also hard for him. This is why uh, the, the, that verse that we mentioned briefly before is so important, verse 13. Paul says, I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. In other words, hey, this is hard for me. I'm not saying this was easy for me to learn, but praise God, I can do all this, not on my own ability, but through the strength of Christ who gives me strength. Only through Christ's, Christ's strength can you and I walk in a true sense of contentment. He is the answer to that question, what can fill our innermost being? It's got to be Christ and his strength and his living water that brings us that sense of satisfaction and contentment in life. In the natural, Paul says, I didn't have the strength to do it, but Christ has given me the strength. Paul would write another letter to a church in a town known as Cor Corinth. He'd write a couple of letters there. Second Corinthians is when he writes about a revelation that he's had. And he writes to that church there, he's, Jesus had taught him that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, on your own, you're too weak to do it, but don't worry. My grace and my strength are enough. My power is made perfect in those times where you feel too weak to do the things I've called you to do. Here's Paul. He's stuck in this Roman jail cell. He doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to be there. He could have easily in that moment, you know, started to have thoughts like, you know, if I could just get out of here, if I could just get unstuck, boy, the world would find that I get, they, I mean, I would be unleashed. Man, I'd get out of this jail cell and I would do such incredible things for God out there. If I could just get out of these confines, I would do great things. He could have taken that attitude, but that's not the attitude we see with Paul. The attitude Paul had was, you know what? As long as I'm here, I'm going to make the most of this here and now. And we know, we talked about this in one of the previous weeks of this series, Paul, one of the things he did is he said, I'm going to, as long as I got to be here, I'm going to reach these Roman soldiers that I'm chained to for Christ. And we have strong indication from Scripture that that's exactly what he did. He reached those men with the gospel as he was chained there to them. He said, I'm going to not worry so much about what happens when I get out of here. I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity God's placed in front of me here and now. Even though I feel stuck here, I'm going to choose to bloom right here where I'm planted. I'm going to make the most of this opportunity and not think that somehow, some way out there, that's where contentment lies. And some of us need to grab a hold of this this morning because, you know what, like Paul, some of us feel stuck you feel stuck in your situation. You feel stuck in your job. You're saying, if I could just get out of this dead-end job, I know I could do something better with my life, but it's this stupid dead-end job with this dumb boss of mine. I'm stuck here, and if I could just get out, everything would be better. Some of you have even looked at your own marriage, and you said, I'm stuck in this bad marriage, and if I could just get out of this marriage, I know out there is the perfect one for me. There's somebody out there. I could, I, if I could just leave this one behind, I could grab a hold of somebody else and we would be a match made in heaven. Some of you, I joked earlier about the kids, but some of you legitimately, you find yourself, you're like, you're in, in stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home parent mode, stay-at-home dad mode, and you're, you're the person, you're saying, like, like, seriously, how can I do anything with my life? When all I do every day is make peanut butter and jelly and wipe snotty noses and clean ketchup stains out of shirts and clean up puke in beds. Guess what I did this weekend? Yeah, it's a little snapshot. You know, I mean, <laughs> TMI, too bad. You know, <laughs> like how can I really make anything in my life with these kids here? If I could just, you know what? They don't need to move out of the house. How about if we just get to age six and we can send them to school? And then I'll be able to do something. Then I'll be able to make my life matter. And literally, there's some I've talked to that their response has been, if I could just get unstuck from this city, if I could get out of St. Cloud, if I could get out of central Minnesota, I could do something better somewhere out there, but I can't do those things as long as I'm here. But my question for you, or rather... Let me make this comment. Here's, here's the, the trouble. You know who goes with you wherever you move to? You. 
You know who, you know who goes to the next marriage with you? You. You think that you can't work it out in this marriage and it's going to be better in the next one? No, no, no. You, you're part of the package. You think that you can't work it out in this city, but it's somehow going to be better if you move to another city or another state? No, you come with the package. You think that, that somehow, you know, that, that, that these children are holding you back? Listen, you're missing, you're missing it. You're missing it. You've got an opportunity. In six years, you're going to send them off to school, and then everybody else is going to be trying to influence them as well. You've been granted a window of time. What if God wants to use you in this five- or six-year window to say, man, I'm going to invest everything I can in these kids' life now Well, I've got them 24-7 because in a few years, they're off, and then friends and teachers and who knows who else is impacting my kid's life. I've got a window of time. I know I feel stuck sometimes, but I'm going to make the most of it. I know I feel stuck in the city, but what if God wants to use me to change it? I know I feel stuck in this relationship, but what if instead of just casting it off for a better one, I started to work on this one? I know I feel stuck in this job, but what if there's somebody here that God wants to use me to reach, another, another coworker or a regular client that comes through our doors, and God's placed me here to reach that person? I'm not saying that you shouldn't have dreams that you aspire towards and that you shouldn't pursue a better version of yourself and that you shouldn't look towards things and say, boy, it would really be nice to have that and so I'm going to work on it. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying those things can't be your source of contentment. They can't be your source of, of life. And if they are, you've missed, you've missed the mark sorely. As the musicians come this morning, what if you let Christ teach you contentment? Some of us need to re-enroll this morning in the school of contentment. And maybe There's been phases where you've had to learn some of those lessons, but maybe you're able to evaluate your life and say, you know, the truth is is I'm I'm, I'm pretty discontent with where I'm at right now. I'm pretty discontent, but I'm getting the sense that God may want to use me here and now. He may want joy and peace for my life here and now, not just someday, not just once or when or whenever I acquire it. And the promise that Paul gives, it's the last meaningful verse he writes in Philippians before he gets to the part of the letter where he's saying goodbye and all the, you know, this person says hi and that person says hi. The last verse of substance. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Paul says, here's the promise. God has promised to provide for all your needs. It doesn't mean he's going to provide for all your wants. Doesn't mean he's going to give you everything on your bucket list. He's going to provide for your needs according to his riches and glory. If you'll learn to set your eyes on him and have him be the goal, him be the prize. Pursue him in a relationship with him. Allow him to fill that insatiable appetite with his living water. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Very quickly, you'd say, Pastor, by my own admission, I'm going to raise my hand and admit this. Right now, I am in, I find myself in a season of discontent. I find myself in a season of pursuing it, whatever it might be to you. Would you just raise a hand? You say, this was, this was a message I needed to hear this morning. Hands going up all across this room, all across this room. And so, Lord, right now, Father, we just first acknowledge, God, that we have once again allow discontentment to slip into our hearts. Whatever that's looked like for each person in this room, God, we've allowed it to slip into our hearts. We've grown discontent with our station in life, discontent with the possessions we have, discontent with the relationship. God, discontent in some way. And God, uh, we come to you first in just in repentance and acknowledgement. God, repentance that we have somehow bought into the lie that if we just acquire it, that that'll somehow fulfill us. God, in some cases, we've even propped up it as an idol before you. It has taken precedence over our relationship with you. It has become more important to us than you are. And so, God, we repent of these things. And God, we are challenged this morning by Paul's words about contentment. And God, we recognize it's not a natural occurrence, but Father, it's a learned experience. And so God, right now, 
by raising our hands, really what we're saying is, Lord, we're willing to re-enroll. God, in, 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 in the lessons you want to teach us, we want to re-enroll in this school of contentment. God, show us again what it means to have peace and joy here and now, not just once and when. God, fill our hearts with that living water afresh and anew. God, that living water, God, that we thirst for and we long for. Father, forgive us for trying to shove in and stuff in all these other things to somehow meet that need. God, when the answer is so plain and it's so clear, come to me, all who are thirsty, and I will give you living water that will flow from your innermost being. God, that's what we're hungry for. That's what we're longing for today. And so, God, I just pray that you even right now begin to do that. God, begin to, to, to just give us a greater sense of contentment. And God, now I pray, as we head out of this place, God, to our different positions and places in life, God, help each and every one of us this week, God, to not just wait for once and when, but God, to choose to thrive here and now. God, to make the most of our situation, no matter the circumstances we're living under. God, we love you. I pray that you bring these things to pass in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you, church. Thank you so very much for uh, just being so receptive to God's word this morning. I pray that you have an incredible week. Don't forget Terebinth meal party tomorrow night, uh, parking lot cleanup party Wednesday night. Otherwise, we'll look for you next Sunday. You're going to want to be here. Crystal Conrad's going to bring a word that you're not going to want to miss. It's going to be awesome. God bless you, church. Have an incredible week.